Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a series we're nearing the end on family seasons. And this is lesson number 12 in that series for June 22 of 2019, entitled, What Have They Seen in Your House? Hmm, that's a quite good question, isn't it? And we've got some interesting biblical stories to cover in that session. But as always, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Wonderful Father, we once again gather here to talk about your word and about the lessons we need to learn from that word. We think of people like Hezekiah and the mistakes that he made. Help us not to make those mistakes. We think about Manasseh, his son, what a terrible case he was. Lord, help us to learn from these lessons how we can be better representatives of you in our own homes and in uh, opportunities we have to witness to others around us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, after calling the children of Israel out of Egypt, leading them down to the foot of Mount Sinai, but before he gave them the Ten Commandments, he gave them these instructions. You will, uh, you will be my chosen people, dedicated to me, and serving me as priests, if you obey me and keep my covenant. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Peter, way over near the end of the New Testament, picked up that thought and said, Oh, guess what? That Those terms must apply to all Christians now, not to just the Jewish people. And he said basically the same thing in 1 Peter 2, 9. We are supposed to be a chosen race, a holy nation, God's own chosen people. How do we go about doing that? Can we... What does that mean? It says we are supposed to proclaim the wonderful works of God because he has called us out of darkness into his own marvelous light. Okay, so, first question. Are all our homes marvelous lights in our communities? We, should, we strive. Yeah, wish that they were. <laughs> we wish. That wasn't the answer you were supposed to give. Well, maybe Dennis's is better. We strive to. Yeah. Yes, we open ourselves up to the light, walk in the light, and then he will he will shine through us. Yeah. And you know that famous verse, very famous verse found in John 13, 34 and 35. And now I give you a new commandment, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Wow. It is God's plan, clearly, that Christian homes should be beacons of light to all around them. Is that true in our communities? Well, perhaps you don't remember the story of Hezekiah. He was seriously ill, found in Isaiah 38 and 39, very seriously ill. God told him through Isaiah that he was going to die. And he turned over and prayed fervently and cried to the Lord, and the Lord said, okay. I'll give you another 15 years. And there was a sign given. What was the sign given? Sundial turning back. He had the choice of moving the sundial forward back ten, forward 10 steps or back 10 steps. He says, well, forward 10 steps are not going to surprise anybody. And in those days, they had a kind of a ladder on a slope and, and the sun would go along and they, they, would, they would go the steps on, the, on this ladder. So that was their sundial. And he said, no, let's have the sun go back ten steps. And it did, and who heard about it? Babylonians. The Babylonians, who were they great... They didn't just hear about it, they saw it. Right. Great uh, scholars of the sky. Um, and um, I suppose, can you imagine what they would have done with a Hubble telescope or something like that? Wow. Well... And so they decided, we've got to come over there and find out what kind of a deal this is. I mean, who prays to God and gets the sun to move? Of course, it was really the earth that moved, but he didn't recognize that, I don't think. Um, and we have some words about that. Dennis, I think that's your department. Yeah, this is uh, uh, taken from Second Chronicles 32, verse 25 and 31 from the Good News Translation. But Hezekiah was too proud to show gratitude for what the Lord had done for him, and Judah and Jerusalem suffered for it. 
And even when the Babylonian ambassadors came to inquire about the unusual event that had happened in the land, God let Hezekiah go his own way in order to test his character. Wow. What a sad commentary. Well, uh, let's think about that. Do if people come and, and, and ask us about how we're doing or how wonderful we're doing, what do we say to them? Well, that's the question. <laughs> that's the do question. We, do we tell them? God is so good. Yeah. Right. And that's why I have all this money and this nice house and this nice car. and Hmm. Yeah. Well, Hezekiah made another big mistake. His son Manasseh was the worst king in Judah's history. He was, he was 12 years old when his father died, which means that he was born... Late in Hezekiah's life. Late in Hezekiah's life. In fact, after this event. Apparently after. Now, there might be some argument about that in terms of how you put together the, those funny numbers about the Hebrew kings, but yeah, it seems like he was born in those last few years of Hezekiah's life, and he was the worst king... The worst. He tried to undo everything good his father had done. He sacrificed his own children on the altar, the pagan altars. He just did, mm, made things as bad as you could possibly imagine. Do we know anything about his siblings? He not must, really. He must not have been an only child in that. No. So by the way, we traditionally think of it that, that Hezekiah was, I mean, that Manasseh was 12 years old when his father died, 15, and 15 years after the uh, illness. Maybe Hezekiah would have been better off having died without Maybe producing the rest a son. Of us. Maybe the rest of us would be better off with our Maybe the nation would have been the better nation, off. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, boy. Well, so what did the. Hezekiah say to the ambassadors who came to see? Show them everything that all the gold and silver and the look temple at, and look at what I have here. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now maybe he said, Look at what God has given me. Probably so. But did the turning back of the sundial have anything to do with his wealth or his military equipment or his yeah. prowess? No. So God left him to test him, as Dennis read for us. So how well do we do today in our lives, every day, at praising God? Question. Yeah. Isn't it said that God doesn't test us? He doesn't give us things just to test us. James one thirteen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but we have Second Chronicles 32 here. What do you think happened? What... It says God left him to test him. So I don't think it's God testing him. He said, Just we move. step back a little bit and we'll see what the guy does. So do you think that it was really God stepping back and uh, the devil bringing these things on? Do you think the devil would miss an opportunity like that? I don't think he would. <laughs> I don't think so either. Or was it the devil saying, hey, it's my turn? Yeah, maybe. My turn to see what he's really like. This is kind of like the, what he's really yeah. like. This is kind of like Job. Mm -hmm. Except right. Job did it right, and Hezekiah didn't. Are the, are the Greek words for tempted that we translate tempted or tested the same? Because well, that's what it says be, in here. You're this would be to Hebrew. James. This would be Hebrew. I, I understand. Oh, that, you mean over in James? Yeah, where it oh. says he says he can't. He uh, I am. Uh, let no one say he is tempted. Uh -huh. I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Yeah. I don't know that that's mm -hmm. the same as testing. Uh, probably. I would have to look it up to be sure. Yeah. I would look at the New Testament as a, as a clearer representative of what God has in mind than I would at the Old Testament. Yeah. Sometimes the Old Testament gets it right, but you've got to remember Jeremiah 8, verse 8, the scribes have made it into a lie. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's our escape clause for me. And then, of course, Jesus in uh, uh, Matthew 23, started verse 13 and following, he says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Seven times he said that, one right after the other. Yep. So he's not complimenting the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, which is a pretty broad, pretty, pretty big bunch of people. Mm -hmm. Who are the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites today? 
Now, just a minute, Gordon. Be <laughs> careful. Uh -oh. Bible careful. theologians. Careful. No, I don't need to be careful. It's it's pretty blunt. <laughs> well, I'll ask you another question. Are you referring to us? It could be, if we don't tell the truth. A study was done among Seventh-day Adventists. Numer numerous studies have been done. The church is doing various kinds of studies, trying to figure out what thing or combination of things will really make the church grow and, and, and change. And a study was done, and this study determined that the average Seventh-day Adventist, after they, had, even the ones who became Seventh-day Adventists, after they become, after they have been Adventists for seven years, never again invited a non-Adventist into their home. The average Seventh-day Adventist, after they've been, you know, when the first, when they first become Adventists, they're still inviting their friends and so forth. But slowly but surely, they stop inviting their non-Adventist friends. Seven years, the average Adventist never invites anybody except Adventists. Well, I've never heard that. Where does that come from? Well, I will have to go back and look. That one was done a long time ago. Hmm. Well, I remember reading an uh, anecdote uh, where this person at a college church mm -hmm. was complaining to the pastor that they had been there five, uh, over five years and nobody invited them home. Really? You know, and, uh, and the pastor's response, well, the average length of stay here is five years or less, so you're actually in the majority. Have you invited anyone home? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Well, anyway, it's very unlikely that our visitors will open up a conversation about spiritual matters. If we invite somebody over, they say, wow, your spiritual condition is so much better than ours. <laughs> you don't have to choke up <laughs> I said that. How can we learn to open up that subject in sensitive and appropriate ways? Do we dare to mention sens sensitive things like religion to people? Uh, at times you can. you got to be a little careful. If you pick up on something they say, you can enlarge that a little bit. Mm -hmm. well, you, you know, when questions are asked, you can refer to Scripture. You know, mm -hmm. Proverbs, it says this. I think that's the key thing. When questions are asked, often I pray, Lord, give me a time in this four and a half hours that will open the door to say something. Because I'm not sure we do very well by just hitting them cold because mm -hmm. you think it's important. But if they ask a question, and usually when somebody dies, that's a real interesting time. People think more clearly about what life yeah. is like. Yeah. And I find that on the golf course so often. If I pray, Lord... Open the door in this next four hours. About uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Yep. So uh, it all starts with filling our hearts with the goodness of God. And your attitude about what's happening it's, around you at the time. It's been demonstrated also, and I don't think this should surprise anybody, but one of the best witnesses is those who have become Adventists telling their stories. Because it's pretty hard for anyone to argue with you about your story. You know, um, I mean, and shouldn't we be, you know, hopefully the story is a good one. We've been brought to life from being spiritually dead, right? Isn't that reason enough to praise God? We oh, heard such a story at Myra's class reunion this last weekend. Mm -hmm. It was quite a story. Mm -hmm. It was quite a story. Yeah, well... What kind of opportunities do we manage to share faith in our homes? Well, obviously the most natural opportunity we have to share our faith is with the members of our own households. That is our most important mission field. Okay, Gary, I think you've got some words on that. Yes, this is John 1, verses 40 to 42. One of them was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. At once he found his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah. And they have in brackets, this word means Christ. Then he took Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas. And then there's the comment here, This is the same as Peter and means a rock. 
It's from the Good News Bible. And then we go to Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 to 7. Never forget these commands that I am giving you today. Teach them to your children. Repeat them when you are at home and when you're away, when you are resting and when you are working. Very good. Well, clearly, right from Old Testament times, from Moses, God intended for us to instruct our children intentionally, have times when we actually sit down and we talk about the Bible, we teach the truths about the Bible, and casually, uh, if you want to call it that, by our behavior, by our daily activities, our children will see, okay, that's the way, hopefully they see that's the way a Christian should act. So how are we doing on that score? Don't everybody talk at (laughs) once. Well, again, as Dennis says, we're striving. I see, we're (laughs) striving. Well, we, I think most of us are familiar with, and maybe I should just read a few verses here from the book of Ruth. Again, they started crying. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye and went back home. But Ruth held on to her. You remember the story uh, things were bad. There was a drought in Bethlehem. And so you can look right across the valley, right across the Jordan Valley from Bethlehem, and you can see al- almost the entire country of, of Moab over there. And Oak Green are over there, I guess. And so um, no- Naomi's husband decided that he was going to take her and her two son, their two sons and go over there and see if they could find a better way of life for themselves over there. They did. And what was the result? Husband died. The husband died and both sons died. So it turned out, turned out to be not a very good thing. But despite that, despite all those terrible things that happened to her, look at Naomi's resp- what, what she accomplished. So Naomi said to her, Ruth, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her God. Go back with her. Now I, I'm wondering how many of us today would say, uh, go on back to your sister and your God. Or to your church. But Ruth answered, Don't ask me to leave you. Let me go with you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and that is where I will be buried. May the Lord's worst punishment come upon me if I let anything but death separate me from you. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. Wow. Well, Despite all Naomi's setbacks, she managed to witness. What kind of a witness was that? She managed to witness this sufficiently to her daughter-in-laws that that at least Ruth said, I want that. And that's, that's the kind of thing we should be witnessing to our children, right? We don't know what happened to Orpah. We don't know what happened to her family. We don't know what happened to Ruth's family because obviously... We don't have any evidence that they were sisters, so they would have been two other families. But Ruth managed to find herself into the, in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the royal line of Judah and Israel. That was a pretty well, neat trick, wasn't it? Interesting, because that only happened because the one who was first in line said he didn't want to have his, his genealogy messed up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so she went to Boaz who, of course, already had his gene- genealogy messed up because right. Rahab was his yeah, gene- grandmother Bo- or... Mother. mother or, yeah. Rahab was the mother of Boaz. She right. was... So, so he, we have t- here two pagan ladies in a row. So what's left of the genealogy? <laughs> well, what, I, what I love about this story is that Naomi was depressed after her husband and both her sons had died. What a surprise. And, right. Exactly. I mean, but she was loved by one of her daughter-in-laws. Mm-hmm. So at some point, Naomi had been a wonderful wife and mother to her daughters-in-law. Mm-hmm. And that love only comes from God. Yeah. So uh, I think that's how she knew about the God in heaven. And unfortunately, in our society at least, mother-in-laws don't have a, huge, a hugely good reputation. And here's one who did very well, right? Mm-hmm. You think any of Ruth's family ever made their way over to Bethlehem to see how she was doing? Or did she ever go back to say, 
Guess what? I have a rich husband. I'm doing very well. No. You don't think she ever went back? No. no. You think she well, did? not to say those things. Oh, okay. If she did go back, it wouldn't be to say those things. Do you think she had any idea that Jesus was going to be a descendant of her? Mm-hmm. Well, but she... She might be te- pretty surprised someday. Yeah. Yes. But technically, that prophecy was already in the works. Yeah. So... Did she know it? Well, mm. I wonder, you know, how, if you were if you were Boaz and your mother was was right. Rahab, you know that your father is in the direct line, but then the mother's Rahab, would you be inclined to say, well, no, not can't happen. be me. What? <laughs> it's not going to happen this time. Yeah. This also, time. Ruth was a Moabitess. Yeah. I mean, she wasn't one of the chosen... Nope. Well, and Rahab certainly wasn't either. No, Not at all. Supposed to marry, marry the Moabites. Yeah. yeah. So. Maybe Naomi was a little lax in that respect. Do you think uh, Ruth lived long enough to find out that her great grandson ended up being king? Mm-hmm. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, coming down to New Testament times, what do you think would have happened if Andrew had not told his brother Peter? about Jesus. God would have had to find another way to get to Peter. (laughs) (laughs) Another way to get to Peter, okay. It's so often the case that Christian parents just think that somehow their children just automatically absorb their faith. And that's a tragic mistake. The home is the most obvious place for sharing the gospel. This must not be this must not be taken for granted. Parents need to find ways to witness to their children. And Jim? Back to Ruth. They went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived the whole town got excited, and the women there exclaimed, Is this really Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she answered. Call me Mara, because Almighty God has made my life bitter. When I left home I had plenty But the Lord has brought me back without a thing. Why call me Naomi when the Lord Almighty has condemned me and sent me trouble? This, then, was how Naomi came back from Moab with Ruth, her Moabite daughter-in-law. The barley harvest was just beginning when they arrived in Bethlehem. And we know how the story went on. Very, very interesting sequence of events. Anyway, Naomi felt that God had dealt her several terrible blows. She even told her friends back at Bethlehem to, to call her bitterness, Mara, instead of my delight, Naomi. But in spite of all of that, she obviously managed to attract Ruth. We may go through hard times. All of us have probably had some kind of hard times in our life, but few of us have had it any worse than, than Naomi did. Are we acting like our homes are our most important mission fields? Sometimes, depending on a variety of circumstances, a Christian may find himself or herself married to an unbeliever. And Paul and Peter both had some advice about that. What's the general advice? If your spouse is willing, stay with them. If your spouse is willing, stay with them. Okay. What has been your impression as you have observed people? Uh, is the unchristian, the non-Christian partner more likely to draw the Christian partner away from the church or is the Christian partner more likely to draw the non-partner Christian partner into the church? I think it depends. My When we became Seventh-day Adventists, when I was maybe eight, and before that we were Catholic, and my father lost his mind. You know, he felt like he was losing everyone because, you know, how do you fight with God? And he made my mom's life miserable, but my mom stayed steadfast, Mm -hmm. and he couldn't do it. And most of her children went with her. We stayed in church, and he really, he wasn't the same after that. Wow. Yeah. Did he ever come over? Mm -mm. No. He became really bitter and not nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That can happen. This uh, reunion, again, that Myra was at this last weekend... um, there was one couple that was there that the gentleman had not been a Seventh-day Adventist. He was married to a Seventh-day Adventist woman. 
the Seventh-day Adventist woman died, and he still didn't uh, have anything to do with the church. And then he changed after after she died. Wow. wow. And then he married uh, that that guy that went into the church, married another Seventh-day Adventist girl. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, even if it doesn't happen during your lifetime, yeah. a spouse's lifetime, it might happen afterwards mm -hmm. because of that influence. So the Bible recommends loving kindness, unwavering fidelity, humble service, and winsome witness on the part of the believer to have a sanctifying influence on the spouse. Ephesians 5.21 says, Submit yourselves to one another because of your reverence for Christ. Now, that submission does not ex extend to being the recipient of abuse. Violent partners are not to be accepted as, nor as the norm. So I, we're not going to suggest that violent partners should be tolerated. So what could the church community do to try to help unbelieving partners of church members? What kind of things can we do? Invite sure. them to join in in activities. Okay. Even invite them to your home to eat together? Come to the church. Come to the Sabbath school picnic and stay for the discussion afterwards. Yeah. Be, be friendly. Yeah, just be friends. Yeah. So Go many, places with them. So many Do things with you know, them. You can visit at times. I've, we've all done it. And you might as well have not been there for the, all the approach or friendliness that was shown to you. Yeah, well. And I think parents can be overbearing to their kids. Meaning well, but sometimes mm -hmm. that does not work. Yeah, okay. Well, inviting them to church activities obviously is a very good point. Yoli, uh, you've got some information about how we should relate to... First Corinthians 11, uh, verse 1. Imitate me then, just as I imitated Christ. Second Corinthians 3, verse 18. All of us then reflect the glory of the Lord with our uncovered faces. And that same glory coming from the Lord, who is the Spirit, transforms us into His likeness in an ever greater degree of glory. Wow, wonderful. So we're challenged to follow the examples of believers who, in turn, are following the example of Christ. Would any of us dare to say what those words that Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ? I guess maybe if you said, imitate me, only in the ways I imitate Christ, it would be all right. Qualify it. Huh? Qualified it. Well, like it or not, we all have an influence on other people around us. They influence us, we influence them. And if Jesus is one of the major influences in our lives, we will in turn reflect that image to others. This is one of the most important ways in which we can share the gospel. That is especially true, as we already have noted, within the home itself. Ellen White wrote, Social influence is a wonderful power. We can use it, if we will, as a means of helping those about us. Ministry of Healing 354, paragraph 2. And the, the, the key word that jumps out at me there is helping. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're interested in their needs, what... You, yeah. you know them, and, and you're not just throwing stuff out there, shotgun, you're... You're trying to get to know them and, and maybe mm -hmm. experience what they can. You know, if they like to go to Dodger games, you know, mm -hmm. you could go with them to so Dodger games. You're not suggesting to pick up the guy in the corner who's looking for a job and take him home? Well, if he's looking for a job, then maybe I should help him or something mm -hmm. or direct him to U Reach. And, uh, That's a good idea. Maybe uh, people don't know about re you reach. I may not be able to help him yeah. personally, but I could direct him to somebody who has more expertise in that area. Certainly, um, social interaction is a way we can we can influence people. Yeah. Unfortunately, we need to remember, however, that not every interaction is going to be a good one. There are passages in Scripture like Jeremiah seventeen nine, John two twenty four and twenty five, and Romans three twenty three that. Tell us that none of us is perfect, right, Gordon? Jeremiah seventeen nine. Who can understand the human heart? There is nothing else so deceitful. It is too sick to be healed. Wow. 
There's not a lot of positiveness in that statement, is there? <laughs> well, so how can we best witness not only to our children, but to other people we re- interact with? And we have our children, remember, that time is not just when they're five or six or even younger. It extends until they're teenagers, and it extends until maybe when they're 50, they come back home again for some reason. So they're still our children. Just be sensitive to their needs and, mm-hmm. and try to help them where you can. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, look at a couple of passages. Look at Isaiah 58, 6 and 7. The kind of fasting I want is this. Remove the chains of oppression and the yoke of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Share your food with the hungry and open your homes to the homeless poor. Give clothes to those who have nothing to wear and do not refuse to help your own relatives. Would we need to modify that statement today? To a certain extent, yes. Mm -hmm. You can give stuff, say, goodwill, or you could send (coughs) somebody to one of the Christian-based missions. It's coming up for Easter. I mean, some of these people, that's about the only exposure they get to Christianity or anything, and they do good work that they're used to doing. Paul said to the Romans, share your belongings with your needy fellow Christians and open your homes to strangers. That's Romans 12, 13. Would we dare to do that today? Or is that a dangerous thing to do? It's dangerous. Depends on the stranger. And how do you how do you figure out who's safe and who's not safe? Well, you pray about it. You pray about it. Back, back in the... <coughs> Uh, Old Testament, at least, or and New Testament, it was hospitality was just. You think of Lot and the angels mm-hmm. uh, coming to yeah. to there, and he didn't know them at all, but he invited them into his yeah. home. And Abraham invited Abraham. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we need to we need to think through these issues very carefully in our day. Um, it's um, of course Abraham had his own private army to help protect him didn't he (laughs) so anyway the story of Abraham and Sarah were welcoming Jesus Christ himself and two angels into their home is an amazing story one wonders how conservative Jews read that story and I I, I wish I had one of them here to help us read through it Abraham broke all the rules of kosher when feeding God himself (laughs) <laughs> but that's probably not the most important point we need to make here, is it? Well, what I think about is, what if there's a teenager that is on the street? Mm-hmm. They're not an addict. They're trying to go to school. But they have left their home because of abuse of all kinds. Oh, yes. And he is, or she, is praying to God for yeah. someone to come help them. Yeah. Yeah. And you just don't know. You're, you have to be open to the idea that God might tap you on the shoulder, tap you on the shoulder and say, today is your day. Yeah. Wow. And that doesn't mean that, that they won't steal from you or it just says, go help. I think about uh, that story about Abraham and Sarah. And before those people left, what did they say to Sarah? Well, they didn't really say it to Sarah. They said it to Abraham, and she was listening behind the curtain. You're going to get pregnant. <laughs> you're going to have yeah. a baby. Yeah. Next time I come back, in less than a year, you're going to have a baby. Uh-huh. I- I'm sure there's no way you could control your... Sarah was back there laughing. God says, why did you laugh? And she says, oh, no, I didn't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and so they named the baby, of course, Laughter. Oh, yeah. Since the world is so diverse now, I think maybe we may not have something to give, something tangible to give other people, but I think if we become culturally sensitive to people mm. yeah. and just be kind in the simplest way, I think that alone goes a long way. Mm-hmm. Is that the silent witness? <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Think of the story of Jesus with Zacchaeus, or Zacchaeus. And what happened in that story? 
Jesus was traveling. I mean, and this is an amazing thing. We don't often we don't realize the details of this. The children of Israel who lived in Galilee did not want to. It was not safe really for them to travel through the territory of Samaria, which was directly south from them and between them and Jerusalem. So they would travel across the Jordan River down to Gentile territory until, I guess I should do it this way for the camera, down to Gentile territory and then cross the Jordan River again to Jericho. And from Jericho then they would travel up to Jerusalem. And this, since this was the Passover, they would be traveling in huge numbers. I mean, probably hundreds of people in a group all traveling together, just having a good fellowship as they worked, walked along and up, progressed there. And in the middle of that crowd, here's so Jesus, what, what is Jesus doing here? See, previously, if you read the stories about Jesus on other occasions, did he go up to Passovers in a big crowd? No. He tried not to attract, to attract attention to himself. But this time, he knew that he was going up to be crucified. And he wanted as many people as possible to know about it. So here he is, traveling in the middle of this huge crowd, thousands of people, I'm sure, that whole experience. And right in the middle of that, they come to Jericho. They likely stayed overnight around Jericho. Next morning they get up, they're ready. Everybody's getting together, getting organized, ready to travel on. And here's the story of Zacchaeus. And what does Zacchaeus do? Well, he wanted to see Jesus, but he wasn't very tall, so he got it up into a tree so he could see him pass by. Yeah. He already knew about Jesus. And if you read the chapter on Desire of Ages about Zacchaeus, he had already tried to turn his, turn, turn his life around. And there he is up there in the tree, and Jesus walks right by, and he says, Zacchaeus, as we used to sing as a kid, you come down. I remember my kids used to shout that. They loved it. You come down. You know. For I'm going to your house today. Exactly. <laughs> Amazing. I don't know how many of you ladies, how would you feel about it if God invited himself to your house? Say, can you wait a little bit so I can come <laughs> <laughs> Well, in Revelation 3, he stands at the door and knocks. And knocks. Yeah. And the door and knocks. Please, please forget to clean it up. And it's interesting in the picture, the famous picture about that is, you notice there's not a handle on the outside of the door. Mm. Yeah. It can only be opened from the inside. inside. So what is true hospitality? Mm. Is it opening the door when your house isn't clean. <laughs> opening the <laughs> door when your house isn't clean, okay. It's sharing what you have. If you have two coats, you give one. And showing I, interest in other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The simplest little thing, whether you're in a restaurant, the waitress comes, that's show true. an interest. I think yes. that's one of the best things we can do yes. is yeah. look people in the eye and ask how they're doing and learn a little bit about them. I always ask them their name. My what? wife would be embarrassed to death if she heard me say this, but uh, she's a fantastic hostess. And she has. <laughs> we lived for many years in Africa. I can remember the... Just for an example, one time we lived in this house in Africa, in Arusha, Tanzania, and my parents had come to visit us. So we had already had visitors in our house. And it's 11 o'clock at night, and in that part of Africa, nobody moves at 11 o'clock, unless you're in a bus, a big bus. Yeah, it, it, you, could, you can take an overnight bus, but normal people don't move. There's a knock at our door. We go down, and here's two white men we have never seen before standing at our door saying, you know, do you have a recommendation about where, what kind of a hotel we could stay in tonight? How many hotels were there in the area? None. Zilch. <laughs> Not too many. <laughs> None? Well, there are probably one or two potentially. It would be very expensive. Anyway, we said, well, why don't you just come on in? Well, he says, it's not quite that simple. There are 11 of us. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, my wife said, come on in. She took good care of them. And was, so, and that's not the only time. We've had times when our entire living room was full of people oh, wow. with their sleeping bags. Oh, wow. Just step by step. 
we lived not too far from Mount Kilimanjaro, and people, other Adventist missionaries would come from here and there. And, we want to climb the mountain. Could we stay at your house? And then the wife and the kids would stay at our house while the men and men would go and climb the mountain. I'm sure they emailed ahead or texted. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, always. Ahead. Always. Yeah. Fired you some money to get, buy food. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So that's kind of the stuff that's real hospitality, okay? So, Myra, I think you have something about that. Yes. Families sometimes complain that they lack the facilities, the time, and or the energy to offer hospitality. Others feel awkward, unskilled, and unsure about reaching beyond what is familiar in order to associate with unbelievers. Some wish to avoid the complications to their lives that may arise from becoming involved with others. Many contemporary families confuse hospitality and entertaining. What do you suppose that means, hospitality versus entertaining? Very good. Exactly what it says. Yeah, very good. Good point. Yeah. You tell your story, so I'm going to... (laughs) Uh, <laughs> when I was a student here, I lived, uh, you know, rented a room in the back of a uh-huh. garage, uh-huh. and I ran into this. I met this guy. Uh, became we became friends later, but uh, at church, uh, first time he was his first time. So I said, "Come on over for lunch." So I got out my electric skillet and fried up some some veg or something or other, and made some you know a lunch and everything. So. He became an Adventist minister, and wow. he used that story <laughs> to tell his congregation that no matter what, you, you, it isn't about being ready, uh, yeah. you know, having a, a special fancy place to yeah. to bring people. It's it's about having it open. So yeah, yeah. you don't start with Bible doctrines. <laughs> well, no. he wasn't he was an Adventist already, but uh, no. but you know, I just. Uh, yeah. So come on, you know, I was, I was going to eat, so. I could <laughs> tell you all sorts of incredible stories about my wife's hospitality, but uh, we don't have time for that right now. Jim, I think you have something about that. Uh, how, excuse me, how well does your home life reflect your spiritual condition? Far more powerful than any sermon that can be preached is the influence of a true home upon human hearts and lives, Ellen White, Ministry of Healing. Page 352. Our sphere of influence, excuse me, our sphere of influence may seem narrow, our abilities small, our opportunities few, our acquirements limited, yet wonderful possibilities are ours through a faithful use of the opportunities of our own homes. Wow. Healing, uh, page 355. Well, think back through your experience. I'm asking you out there. Have you personally been influenced for the truth by your experience in someone else's home? Do you you know other people who have been? What could those lessons teach us? Are we doing everything we can to reach out to those whose spouses are non-believers? What do the heavenly angels have to say about your home as they witness you and all that you do every day? Jackie, I think you've got something there. Okay. We've all heard of that elusive silent witness that we as Christians are supposed to be exuding everywhere we go. It causes people to line up and ask us, what do you have that is different? I want some of that. (laughs) Then we tell them of Jesus and conversions are soon to follow. No doubt testimonies confirm that this phenomenon happens, but for the most part, if we are honest, this scenario is a kind of Christian urban legend that has left many Adventists waiting years for such encounters. In the meantime, guilt creeps in as one wonders why his or her silent witness is not loud enough to gain attention. One of the most incredible conversion stories that I was ever involved in started at a cocktail party. So you never know what, you never know what's going on. We had, him, my wife and I were invited, it was a, a, a class that I was a member of attending at Johns Hopkins University, and this guy invited, he wanted everybody in his, it was actually a lab, he wanted everybody in his lab group to come up to his house, and we said, well, you know, we don't drink alcohol, it's all right, you know, whatever. Anyway, 
that was one of those times when I walked in and someone asked me a question that was beyond belief and that it, that began a series of Bible studies and that young lady became one of the teachers in one of our Adventist institutions. Amen. Really? Amen. But she had a readiness. Yeah, she did. She asked you, opened the door. She yeah. had a question that she had been, she said, I have asked that question to everybody I could think of who had any knowledge about religion for the last seven years. Mm-hmm. And you're the first person who ever gave me a reasonable answer. Well, I think it's important, looking back at the what was just read there, uh, there's a there's a sense in which you're sort of the person seems to be fishing and expecting, mm-hmm. and we should have no expectations. We should Ellen White talks about disinterested benevolence, mm-hmm. which means we're not really in it for ourselves. We're we're just as Jim said, you know, get ask them questions and, and reach out, reach out to them, and uh, sure. and not not expect. And the other thing yeah. is. If you just start shooting a bunch of answers at me when I haven't thought of the questions, mm-hmm. it's just whoo. Yeah, yeah. Well, we all know that God created the first home. What a beautiful place it was. Think about the Garden of Eden. And there wasn't really an opportunity for Adam and Eve to do much witnessing to unbelievers. But we must remember that we have the opportunity to once again live in that Garden of Eden if we remain faithful and and end up in, in the Kingdom of Heaven and that Garden of Eden is going to be there. Well, how often do we allow job responsibilities, social pressures, even church activities to distract us from our primary responsibility to our own children? Could that happen? Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, I'd love to visit, but I got to get to this meeting because I yeah. I got to hear this sermon. You know. Yeah, right. Well, and I'm I'm just going to ask you to to do to do a terrible thing right now. Pretend that you're the devil. Okay. Don't attack me, but pretend that you <laughs> <laughs> pretend that you're the devil. What would you in our world? What would you most of all like to to do to promote your side. Where's the iPad? <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Everybody's in their own iPad. Yeah. No conversation. No, no awareness. Yeah. Uh, earbuds. Mm-hmm. Walking their baby who is facing away from them. They have no... A, a big hornet could attack their baby in their stroller. And they've got their... You know, and they're walking along with no awareness of their own baby. And I would like to ask, and I thank you for that illustration, which group on this earth do you think might be the special targets of the devil at this point in history? Young Church. People. Anybody who claims to be a follower of God. Anybody who claims to be a follower of God. Our young people, especially. Yeah. Especially the young people, right? <laughs> exactly. Well... A study was done some years ago of Adventist young people particularly. And this was just in North America, so those of you outside of North America, you can pretend like this doesn't apply to you. And But it does. <laughs> but, but it does. I'll let you draw your own conclusions. This can make you feel like you've just been hit and, and knocked the wind out of you. This was, this was in a, a, a survey that was done officially and creditably and which the church did not bother to notify people about saying that if from the beginning of the Adventist church every Adventist had managed to keep their own children in the church even if we kept only 80% of those kids the Seventh-day Adventist church today would be in North America would number 8 million. Yeah. And how many do we number right now? One and a bit. <laughs> One and a quarter. That was in a couple of years ago. One and a quarter million. So what does that tell us? I well, it may suggest that. something, but of course the expectation, the hope is that all the 
eighty percent are out in the other parts of the world with their membership out there doing evangelism. But Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a little bit dreamy. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that yeah. statistics. Yeah. You know, you you can't just look at a statistic and yeah. say, well. Yeah, but this the, these numbers are so out there. Eight million versus one and a quarter million. This means that we, if those statistics are true, and there are some questions, you've raised a valid one, we would have <coughs> 600, I mean, six times as many members <coughs> in the Adventist Church in North America than we do now. Well, consistently witnessing to our own children. Witnessing does not mean that we will win them. That's this is really, true. I mean, because Adam and Eve, they walked with God. The Garden of Eden is there. And yet, as we look forward to Noah, how many were on the ark? And he preached for how many years? Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, he, it's, did, he didn't even do a super job with his own kids. No. no. And God well, it shows you how effective the dark angels are. Mm-hmm. God himself yes. lost one-third of his children. Yes. That's in a perfect state. Yes. Right in a perfect state. And that's where the perfect, masterful teacher, yeah. with, no, with no limitations on the, on the lessons that, that were available, but yeah. that's the, that is, gives you an indication of the love of God, the mm-hmm. freedom that in, individuals have to choose to make good or bad decisions. Of but, course, all our homes... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, just the responsibility. Manasseh, was he saved in the end? No. No. Maybe. He, 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 he turned came around back. at the end. He, no. he turned around at the very end. He's the blind. Or Maxwell said, wait till the new Exactly. Yeah. You're going to see Manasseh. And Isaiah. And Isaiah's going to look at him and say, you're here? You're here? <laughs> <laughs> I remember but, him saying that. Yeah. yeah. He got that somewhere. Is that spirit of prophecy? Yeah. My relationship with God is the thing that's important. Yeah, yeah. So loving my children, loving my husband, loving mm-hmm. whoever that is, that he gives me the strength to do that, that's what it's all about, and that's what it's about for every single one of us. We can't make them love us back. We can only do what me and yeah, God Jim. have got going on together. Jim? And if you're, if you're looking for eternal life, what is the message? What is eternal life? Jesus told us what it was. Yeah. John yeah, seventeen right. three. Yeah. It's to know the Father yeah. and Jesus Christ to whom he has sent. And then Jesus in the verse verse four of seventeen, he says, I have accomplished the work you gave me to do. I have made known your character. Mm-hmm. God is a teacher. Mm-hmm. It takes time to educate. And unfortunately remember he'd say Jesus would say, You've heard it said, but I'm going to tell you this. Okay, so Jesus yeah. came to correct the misinformation, and that's what we're t- attempting to do: is to find out really what the truth is. Of course, all of our homes are microcosms of paradise, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Couldn't be any other way, right? Oh, well, so Second Chronicles thirty-three, um, from about uh, ten on, talks about Manasseh's conversion. So. Yeah. No, he. Well, yeah, does it say, you remember what, how, how he was converted? With a hook to his nose, headed off for Babylon? Well, <laughs> got his attention, though. Got his attention. Well, no, it was, yeah. The king of Assyria uh, came up against him, and then, yeah. and then uh, he had an opportunity to tear down the altars. Uh, you know, yeah, that, that's talking about. Uh, go back and look at it very carefully. I'm not, we don't have to, that's yeah. not a big deal. Well, what the first question really sh- that arises when we talk about house- hospitality is to whom should we show our hospitality? And that sounds a little bit like Jesus, a question that was asked to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And what was his response? What kind of person are you going to be? There are so many ways in which Christians could reach out to others in saving ways. How many of those ways can you think of? They might extend all the way from sharing some food to helping someone who has been abused or has lost their home to stay at, a ho- at your house for a period of time. And, um, I mean, we've seen some examples in the last year or so when there have been terrible floods, there have been all kinds of things, and 
at, in times like that, people reach out and, and they, they welcome people into their homes. And that certainly should be a characteristic for Christians when that kind of thing happens. Think of the effect that Jesus had by inviting himself to Zacchaeus' home. Transformation, restoration, salvation. There is no talk of a series of Bible studies or sermons given. Just a gesture of reverse hospitality. And those who experience our hospitality recognize that God's love is being demonstrated. It has a powerful effect on them. But we cannot have that kind of influence just by passing people on the street. We must engage them. We must interact with them. And it doesn't work to stand on the corner like at Hyde Park in, in London and say, Prepare for the coming of the Lord! You know. Many modern societies place a high importance on education, career, upward mobility, rank, wealth, and sometimes even community service. But how many of us prepare to place developing a true Christian home which produces a healthy Christian family at the top of the list? My computer just... Okay. At the end of their lives, how many people wish they had spent more time in the office and less time with their family? Hmm. That's a thought. We recognize that radical hospitality could involve safety concerns for one's family, so how do we deal with that issue? That is indeed a major concern in our times. It is important to be with visitors at all times and in every location and also make them feel welcome in our home, but we also must keep our eye on them. So how can, we under, how can churches reach out with true Christianity, Christian hospitality? The Loma Linda University Church, of which several of us are members, is one of the main sponsors of a pantry located at the clinic where I work in San Bernardino. At that site, there's a pantry where food is given out to thousands of people every week. What does that say to the people who depend on our giving and sharing? Have some of them recognized the effects of Christianity and wanted to know more? A lot of people who work at that pantry are volunteers, and some of them are my patients. And they're, they're, they actually are excited to have the opportunity to give, to give, their, give their time, give their efforts to reach out to others. Those are the kind of people that we should, we could, we should be able to, with just a, a gentle push maybe, uh, or pull maybe I should say, bring them into the church. Let's, let's reach out to people like that. We hope you've given, got some ideas about how to grill Christian hospitality. Our kind and wonderful Father, once again we thank you for these words of wisdom from your word. We thank you for the opportunity we've had to discuss uh, these plans here together. And we ask now that for the benefit of those who've listened in, that uh, some truth may be shared is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.